to treat him on a compassionate basis because he was literally dying. And um, I, I went back to PubMed, uh, which many of you will know is the National Library of Medicine's uh, search engine that's uh, freely available. And I put in words like acetobacter bomanii, the superbug that was taking Tom down, alternative treatments, and uh, multi-drug resistance, and up popped a paper that mentioned phage therapy. So that's how I got the idea. But then w when Chip said that he, he would, uh, you know, be the protocol chair of this N of one case if we found phage, I didn't know where to find any phage. I didn't know any phage researchers. So I went back to PubMed and did a search, and I came across Roy Young's name uh, uh, along with a couple of others. I did restrict our search to... Um, the U.S. because I, I didn't think we had that much time, but um, it, this really did end up being a global effort. But Rai was the first one to respond to my plea for help, and he turned his lab into a command center, um, his words, um, to try to source phage for Tom, and uh, they had uh, only a handful of acetobacter bomani I think identified in the last few years um, prior to this, because this is now five years ago. Um, he turned to Adriana and to Jason um, Gill and um, and a, a, a medical student who uh, Jacob Lancaster who was working in their lab that summer and said, you know, see if you can find any environmental um, sources that have phage that are matched. So Adriana, I found out later, slept in the laboratory for weeks. Um, you know, she put her PhD dissertation on hold and really became an engine behind this effort and found four phages that matched, of which three were um, environmental source phages and one was from a phage company that allowed us to use phage. And then the Navy, you know, stepped in and found another um, set of phages. So Adriana, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, you're a real phage friend in, in the truest sense of the word. And then Sabrina now is a more recent phage friend. Um, she, as many of you will know, is plays a, a, an instrumental role in, in Taylor, which is a Baylor's phage therapy program in Houston. And so uh, she works with the Marissa Lab, and um, at our center, um, uh, the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, or IPATH, we've collaborated with Taylor um, on a number of different cases because uh, they're fairly close. We've also collaborated with um, Dr. Purnay's uh, group um, when we've been uh, contacted uh, up to source phage for patients in, in uh, Europe. But of course, he uh, has his own phage uh, program. And so um, when they need our help, they reach out and vice versa. So this really is a wonderful phage community. And I'll just stop there. Um, I can't see everybody's face that's uh, on. And so there may be some other folks that, um, that I know that I haven't mentioned. Oh, I see Hedia. Um, Hedia is actually um, a postdoc in our iPad lab, so this feels a little bit like Romp Room. I guess you guys are mostly millennials, so you might not have ever seen that show, but it was like this little TV show for kids where like this woman was holding up a mirror and she says, and I see so it's on, and I see so it's on. <laughs> anyway, it's fun. So um, I'll just stop talking now and see if anybody wants to ask questions or get into a discussion or just say hello. Okay, so this is literally, we're going to ask a couple of questions, but everybody that's down below in the audience, people, uh, feel free to raise your hand. We're going to try to get to you as well as soon as possible, and we're going to try to follow in order here. Uh, please come up, say hi, and ask all the questions that you want. Yeah, while we're waiting, I'll just say a special um, hi to, to Jan and, and Jessica as well. Um, they, of course, uh, are well known to you folks because they co-found and co-direct Phage Directory. Um, my relationship to them came in a weird way because I was trying to source phage for a patient named Mallory Smith who also um, has a, a book, a memoir called Salt in My Soul, An Unfinished Life. And that's because we didn't um, succeed in getting phage to Mallory fast enough. And I was really just devastated by that. And uh, Jan and, and Jessica uh, were at a transition point in their own careers and they were inspired by 
by the page time because my tweet was um, shared 432 times. And so that, that's that's what they decided to form page directory so that patients could find doctors and uh, you know researchers that were working on phage and vice versa. So uh, special apply to them. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, that couldn't have summed it up better myself. But yeah, that's exactly what inspired us. And it's so fun that we get to all hang out here. That feels like a long time coming. Yes. Well, given that we didn't get to have any live meetings, I think Clubhouse is a great space for us to be and share and talk and mingle and network kind of like in a mini conference that is free kind of but free <laughs> well iphone free but free let me just say that i am recording now super but if, so if anyone has any questions you can raise your hand again or comments no no not or just comments questions. yeah <laughs> Well, and, and just so you folks know, Tom is in the background here. He already wished Adriana hello, and he'll just say a hello to all of you. Hi there. How's everybody doing? And thanks for the pages. They were real tasty. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <love> Tom. <laughs> How you doing? He's, he's hard at work here. People kind of never really know. Um, to whether or not Tom is okay, because I end up doing most of the talking. He's not really active on social media, but he just came back from his three mile walk. He's still actively doing research and mentoring and is doing great, thanks to all of you. This is awesome, this is awesome. So, what has happened since the story? Well, since the story, okay, well, um, we published our book in February of 2019, so it's just been two years. The paperback version came out in November of, of 2020, um, and it, we updated the epilogue um, a little bit to kind of put it into context for, for the COVID era and to tell people a little bit about what's happened. So um, our center, IPATH, was uh, founded in um, the summer of 2018. So we've been going on for a couple of years now, and the NIH has funded its first um, clinical trials of phage therapy. Um, one of those will be led by uh, Chip Schooley, who I mentioned earlier, and those of you who have read the book will know that he um, was the physician who oversaw Tom's case and was really pivotal in um, you know, working with the FDA and the Navy. Um, and so Chip um, is um, working with the Antibiotic Resistance Leadership Group, which is a network of researchers that have, have been focused on antimicrobial resistance and identifying new uh, antibiotics mostly. Um, and since there's none really in the pipeline, uh, Chip was able to convince them based on not just Tom's case, but all the other case reports and case series that have been published um, internationally in the last few years um, to really choose phage therapy as, as something that they wanted to evaluate. And so this first trial will be translational in nature. It's relatively small to figure out things like dosing, valency, routes of administration, um, those kinds of things to inform a larger efficacy trial. So um, I, I'm aware NIH has funded two um, um, phage therapy trials. The other um, one uh, is uh, being conducted by Intralytics. And also, they just have announced 12 um, grants that um, went to investigators around the world um, to do uh, basic and clinical research to inform phage therapy. So that was uh, around $12.5 that they have invested there as well. So, so I guess that's really um, one of the, the nice things to see that in the last few years that there's really been a sea change in the infectious disease um, research community um, and amongst the clinicians because this kind of cloud over phage therapy um, having been taken up um, so uh, readily by the former Soviet Union really created um, a bias against Soviet science that um, stems back to World War II. And so um, there was a, a lot of a skepticism about phage um, in the West, especially in the U.S. And it's taken 
some time to kind of um, undo that and, and to say, look, you know, we as a society, as a, as a planet, um, our back is up against the wall with antimicrobial resistance. And unless we find some alternatives to antibiotics and some adjuncts to antibiotics, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So, um, so that's really exciting. There's also, um, the, the case that I alluded to in the, in, at the end of the book, um, the first genetically modified phage cocktail to be successfully used to treat um, a human um, was uh, published um, in uh, PLOS Medicine by the Hatful Lab, led by Rebecca Detrick. Um, so if you haven't seen that paper, it's, in my mind, it's, it's more important than Tom's in a lot of ways because it, it's also um, the first mycobacterium infection in a human um, to be treated with phage therapy successfully. And um, the, the uh, girl, her name is Isabel, uh, that's the patient. Um, she's um, been in the news and her mom and I are friends on Facebook and Isabel and I are on on uh, in Twitter and our Facebook as well, and she meets me at Quiz Planet all the time. So she's doing great. But that's really ushered in this new era of the idea that we could use genetically modified phage or synthetic phage to treat infections. Because as uh, uh, um, many of you who are um, more aware of this than me, are, um, when we try to source phage for people, um, we sometimes can only find temperate phage. So, um, and of course, we want to have lytic phage whenever possible. And if we only find temperate phage, um, then um, it's uh, not going to kill the bacterial cell and it can carry um, toxic genes, antimicrobial resistance genes. And the Hatchel lab and others have also shown that that those phages can collude with the bacterial cell to make the bacterial cell resistant to attack from other phages. So that's not good either. So, um, what the Hatful Lab did in that case was use recombinating, which I guess is a predecessor to the CRISPR-Cas gene editing approach, to convert the temperate phage to lytic phage by cutting out the repressor gene. And um, so now there's a lot more biotechs moving into this space. Um, and uh, pharma as well. So um, Johnson & Johnson invested $800 million in um, a company called Locus Biosciences that I don't have a relationship with, but I think it's it's an important step because um, it's um, genetically modified phage, uh, but it's also kind of ushering in this new era where I think we're going to see more um, phage of all kinds, um, wild type natural phage, genetic modified phage, and synthetic phage. So it's very exciting. That is absolutely amazing. There's a lot going on. The phage world is moving. The phage community is expanding. And places like Phage Directory, which create community, is they're amazing to gather us all together. And then here at Clubhouse, this is also a good place. Absolutely. I'm really also encouraged by the, the phage work that's being done in the agricultural sphere. So, for example, I know that Martha Cloakey and her lab have been working on uh, phage preparations in poultry, um, and there's other groups that are working on phage um, in livestock. So that's very exciting. Um, there's also a synthetic phage company in Canada called Cytophage that is uh, working in this space as well, and they just announced um, that they're trialing a, a phage um, um, derived spray to, to treat COVID. So, so um, you know, I think it's it's a very exciting time to be a phage friend. I have a question um, for you, Stephanie. Do you feel like the physicians are, like I imagine they all thought ship was crazy in the beginning or maybe they didn't, but um, is there more of a pull from them to get on the board of phages and try to get phages for their patients or how's that since all everything happened. Yeah, well, initially it was patients and family members that were contacting IPAV for help. Um, and then, you know, after we presented at the IDSA meeting, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America's annual meeting, um, ID Week, um, 
this was a couple of years ago now. We, we gave the closing plenary, and it was Chip, myself, and Tom, and um, about 300 ID physicians uh, from all over the world attended. And there were like a lot of tears in the audience. They were really moved. And Mike Olsterholm, who many of you will know as an epidemiologist known for his COVID and pandemic preparedness work, I met him at a meeting in um, November, and he shook my hand and said, you know, you and Tom are heroes. I said, well, I think that's an exaggeration. He said, no, really, that ID week presentation was the light switch went on. He goes, that's what put phage therapy in the minds of infectious disease physicians. So, I mean, if it wasn't someone like Chip who had, um, you know, the credibility that he, he does with the ID community, he's like the editor-in-chief of clinical infectious diseases, one of the top journals, I don't think we'd be where we are. But also, I mean, Jean-Paul's group and others in Europe have been doing um, amazing work as well and publishing. And um, and so it's not just seen as a boutique um, type of therapy anymore. It's um, there's there's a groundswell of effort here. And I also want to give a shout out to um, all the, the FAGE uh, researchers and clinicians at the Iliava and in Rokla uh, because you know, we really stood on the shoulders of giants, as I mentioned um, in the book, like we, um, without that clinical experience and those page libraries, we would be a lot uh, farther behind. And in fact, uh, Maya Mirabshvili, who I know works with Jean-Paul, she played a key role in advising um, Chip on how to dose phages for Tom through the catheters in his abdomen. So um, it was a, a really a big global effort and it's great to see so much movement um, happen in different ways around the world right now. Awesome. Thank you. Super exciting. I guess I'll, uh, I have a question about the book. So I know I was wondering whenever I read it, I think about the patients that we're treating right now and why they choose phage therapy or why they get, you know, why they go along with it. And so my question is, if you had not been a scientist, do you think you would have tried phage therapy on your husband? Um, you know, it's hard because I'm, I'm, I'm biased and, and I think like a scientist, but, um, but I was desperate and I knew that he was going to die. So if someone came to me and said, why, did, why don't you think of phage therapy? I think I would have you know, said, well, sure, you know, and in fact, um, you know, when Tom's case was actually presented to, um, you know, the parents of a two-year-old when Tom was still in the hospital, that was the second case that um, Chip was involved in treating. Um, they were hesitant, but then they, they saw the pictures of before and after with Tom, and, and, you know, they said, well, you know, we've got to give this a try. So it's interesting, you know, even people who are anti-vaxxers, are, are open to phage. It's kind of seen as the green alternative to antibiotics. And so um, it, it's uh, it's surprising to me that um, it has so much appeal. We get a, a, a lot of people coming to us as patients who still have a bacterial isolate that's susceptible to antibiotics, but they want to take phage instead. So I think that there is a market for this. And, um, you know, I think too that as we are going to be, you know, releasing more data and when it comes to um, safety and, and efficacy, it's going to only encourage more and more people to get on board. And isn't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, in the case of Mycobacterium obsessus, which is a really slow growing intracellular bacterial pathogen, um, um, it's difficult sometimes to, to grow phage because the organism is growing slowly, but that it has uh, taken advantage of that in the case that I mentioned of Isabel in the UK is that um, although only one lytic phage and, and two temperate phages that were converted to lytic phages were used in that cocktail, she's you know, still three years later that she, you know, that she's still being treated with these phage and they have not, the bacterial isolate has not grown resistant. So a slow growing bacterial pathogen may be difficult to source phage for, but um, it means that there's less perhaps uh, of an opportunity for bacterial resistance to emerge because it's not growing as fast as others. Does that, does that seem, I mean, that's my logic, but does that, does that seem right? 
Sounds good to me. Same here. So Runa and Bob had a question. You want to go with Bob? Bob. Bob. Hi, Bob. Nice to see you here. You got to unmute your mic. On the bottom of your screen. Bob, are you there? We can go with Runa first. <laughs> yeah, then we can go with Runa and then Bob. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Um, I had a question about um, administrating phage therapy. I was just wondering what precautionary measures you have um, in case a patient reacts negatively. Like, for example, um, you have excessive inflammation or a cytokine storm. Um, well, uh, I'll start and then maybe um, Dr. Pernay or others who are clinicians um, and have administered page can weigh in because I'm not an MD. Um, I can tell you that in the cases that we've treated at IPAT and those that we've consulted on internationally, so that's probably maybe you know 30 different people, we haven't had any adverse effects um, due to the phage itself. Um, we haven't seen, you know, a cytokine storm that, you know, that led to us, um, you know, having to stop phage therapy, anything like that, even in, in immunosuppressive um, um, cases. Um, however, um, you want to make sure that if it's a gram-negative bacterial pathogen that amount of endotoxin in the phage preparation is as low uh, as possible, especially if you're going to administer the phage intravenously. And that's what we did in Tom's case. And that was one of the innovations is that even though phage therapy has been used intravenously prior to that, it, um, there was a lot of documentation or experience with this. And so the endotoxin, which is essentially the lipopolysaccharide layer um, of the bacterial cell wall, um, uh, really acts as a toxin um, in some cases, and that can generate a, a cytokine storm and, um, and septic shock. So um, that is one consideration. Certainly with genetically modified phage and synthetic phage, the safety profile of the phage um, is going to have a higher bar. But right now, at least in the U.S., the FDA doesn't um, um, require any safety data for natural phage to be used. Um, they're convinced that phage therapy is safe, and um, they're not requiring like, animal studies or anything like that in clinical trials. So um, that's that's what I know. I don't know if uh, others want to chime in. John, what do you want to talk about? I have never seen any uh, adverse uh, events. Uh, as uh, Stephanie says, when you purify enough and you don't have uh, uh, significant endotoxin levels, I don't think you will have uh, any adverse reactions, unless, of course, you, you kill a lot of uh, bacteria uh, uh, very quickly. But that's, that's also true for antibiotics. So nothing very specific for phages, I think. So yeah. this was a consideration that we thought when we were preparing the cocktails for Tom's case. And it was not necessarily, not only that our preparations had low levels of endotoxin, but that bacterial lysis inside of Tom was going to increase the level of free endotoxin. But, I mean, he was in... It didn't seem to have like a gigantic effect other than him getting better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, his, his white blood cell count um, like really did escalate for 24 hours and then it went right back down again. And that's, and we've seen that in other cases too. And, and you'd expect that because phage are invaders, right? And so there's you have a robust immune system. There was no untoward effects. And, you know, Dr. Schooley um, consulted with an endotoxin expert um, and um, his name escapes me. Uh, oh, it was Charles Dinarello um, at the University of Colorado. And he said that it, enough endotoxin is dispersed when there's bacterial cell turnover, even in the absence of phage in the body. Um, so that he didn't consider that any more endotoxin as a result of the phage therapy was going to be a problem. Yeah, uh, I would like to add just a couple more points if, if possible. Uh, 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 obviously, endotoxin is the main 
uh, factor you're uh, uh, you're testing for um, when dealing with gram gram negative uh, in, in, in infections. Uh, the other thing to to consider, which may be a bit more difficult to test for, is what other what other bacterial factors are co-purifying with with your phage, right? There are there are other toxins and uh, virulence factors being pumped out by these bugs that might that might co-purify with with your phage, and um, you can assess that in a number of ways. One is, of course, the the, the host uh, upon which you are purifying your phage. If you if you have that host genome. Uh, sequence, you know everything's there. You know if if there's if there's any any risk of that uh, toxin being being present, and um, there are other uh, antibody based methods for being able to 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 detect certain kinds of toxins. So that if you have an an, an uncharacterized host, which is uh, very common for these uh, single patient uh, 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 emergency use cases where where you don't have much mu much much time. You can use those 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 antibody based kits to to try to assess what other levels of, of toxin are present. And uh, just uh, generally speaking, as well, how 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 we will um, try to test the safety of these uh, cocktails is. To 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 submit them for USP seventy one testing. This is uh, to assure that 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 these preps are 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 sterile. You are attempting to uh, to to grow uh, anything in, in rich media uh, in an in an aerobic and and an and an, and an anaerobic environment. And for for the USP seventy one test, that lasts uh, two weeks. And so it's a it's a pretty strong and uh, a, 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 a stringent method uh, to uh, uh, to to determine whether your prep is uh, sterile. Thanks very much, Austin. And I just realized that you are the Austin Trubliger from um, from Baylor's Taylor program. So I haven't ever seen a picture of you. So now I know. <laughs> yeah, great to be here. So, um, can we get to hear you? Uh, I messaged Bob, but he has some problems because he's on Android and his so, uh, app is having some problems. But you can you can message us the question or the comment that you have, like written down, and we can read it if you want. I think uh, James had a question too. Yeah, yeah. I just had a bunch of was it Rumia's question about uh, adverse effects. I mean, it's very interesting that you know, the, the number you said that you don't, you don't see anything. Would we expect to see, I mean, I, I kind of know the answer, we would expect to see more of the adverse reactions or reapplication of bacteriophage. I, mean, I don't know how many times people have actually had a, 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 a reapplication, but I know that some of the stuff Paul Turner's been doing, that they, they have reapplied phage to the same patient after a few months. But that would be the point where I would assume you'd see the actual adverse effects right well in most of his cases including tom's you know we treated him for um, a month um in isabel's case she's still being treated so it's years later but, years, okay. um, right. um, so um but certainly you know the longer you're using phage uh, the likelihood of, of a bacterial resistance to the phage um you know, can be an issue as well as antibody against the phage. So the untoward effects that you might see are really because phage therapy might be failing unless you have, you know, sourced another phage that's matched to the bacterial mutant or as opposed to, you know, a safety issue um, due to the human immune system's response. Yeah, the the route uh, certainly matters in, in answering your, your your question for CF or CF-like uh, patients where they might be uh, breathing in the 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 the, the phage that that is um, that is uh, more you can more easily with uh, multiple rounds of uh, phage in that manner as 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 opposed to uh, uh, eye treatment with a phage cocktail where the infection might be more difficult to to, to access what what we all know and we're we're used to seeing is that you get a 
strong serum, a strong, uh, a strong uh, antibody uh, uh, res res response to those uh, phages and, and the phage uh, cocktail even uh, months to a year uh, uh, after treatment. So if that, uh, if that infection came back and you, you, you tried to, uh, to administer phage through, through an, and through an IV route, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be much, uh, much hope for that as, as, as well as it, as it did in the, in the first round. Yeah, and I, I guess too that all of us should qualify our statements around, you know, the human immune response to phage because that's the that aspect of phage therapy that we know the least about. Because it's really, as I've been told um, by Carl Merrill and others, it's the interaction between not just the phage and the bacteria, but the host, the, the human host. This case, in this case, that, that we really need to study, and so most of the work that's been done is um, you know cross-sectional as opposed to longitudinal and um, we need to study different compartments um, because um, different routes of administration are going to have potentially different effects as Austin mentioned. So, so can I ask Austin you to like with John Paul maybe uh, the the readmission of phase therapy with you know when you've had a immune response have we seen evidence that's actually led to decline in therapeutic value because of the immune system not because the bacteria is resistant to the phage but because the immune system is actively sequestering out the phage have we seen that so well we, we are now routinely screening for neutralizing antibodies in patients i can tell that the reaction depends very much on the phage so for some phages, we see reactions uh, uh, like week after treatment. First, we don't see any reaction. Uh, only when you apply the phage a second time, uh, we, there was one we had no reaction at all. And then it was applied a few months later, once again, and then we got a reaction. I can also say that we have a patient that we treated with phages three years ago at uh, like percent neutralizing uh, antibodies and three years later we we again checked and there were no antibodies anymore they had all disappeared That's wow. I, I that should, is, I should... is that published yet uh, dr Kinney? excuse me is that published uh what well, uh, we uh, will submit tomorrow what a timely uh clubhouse this is yeah cool. well we, we plan to do a publication in general on, on neutralizing antibodies, but the case I'm talking about, about three years uh, follow-up, I will uh, submit tomorrow. I should, I should maybe uh, stick my hand up and say my, my not conflict of interest, but I, when we talk about the NIH grant, so I, I wanted people to receive one of those uh, specifically looking at reapplication of face therapy in relation to bacterial response. So we're not focusing on the immune system at all because that's not my, that's not my field. So it's interesting. You know, we've been obviously been thinking a lot about, you know, there's this entire side of stuff that we haven't, we, we, we don't have the expertise to question, like how is the immune system going to respond to this? And it's, you know, we, we always write a line in our paper saying it'll probably help, but we don't, we don't know. Absolutely, and congrats on, on getting that award. Um, we're working with a nano engineer, um, Nicole Steinmetz, um, here um, at UCSD, and she's more she's, uh, of a plant virologist, but she's figured out a way to tag the phage um, with a radio label so that you can um, you know, follow the, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. But um, of course, when you administer phage, um, there's going to be a decay um, of the label unless you tag the progeny phase. And so she's working on a way to do that as well. And um, that should be very exciting because then we'll be able to see how much phage actually reaches its target, how much is phagocytosed, how much is like eliminated by the liver and the spleen as part of the reticular endothelial system, that kind of thing. Those are the kinds of studies that we really need because right now dosing is an open question. Um, you know, most of us are, I think, are dosing like 10 to the 9 PNT per mil, which is essentially a billion phages per dose. Um, but then, you know, you're, you know, giving that phage, but you don't know how much the patient is actually receiving because, of course, the drug is alive, right? The, the phage are multiplying as long as the bacterial bits are there. So Isabel's case, I think 10 to the 9 
PFU per mil was administered, and when they tested her blood, it was up to 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13. So um, it's uh, we obviously aren't seeing any safety issues when we are overdosing, um, but we would rather overdose than underdose um, because if you underdose, the phage may be eliminated. So these are the kinds of things that as these translational studies occur, that we'll be able to kind of fine tune dosing so that we can be more precise. Because obviously, um, you know, it may be that in some cases there is an adverse effect. Um, and also, you know, just for the sake of cost, you don't want to be producing more phage than you actually need. Uh, I would like to add that we never saw uh, neutralizing antibodies appear during therapy. It was always uh, uh, after weeks. So we don't think that they will uh, really impact the, the, uh, the result of the, the therapy. Even if there is a neutralizing antibody, I, I suppose the dynamics of time. You know, if you inject phage IV, the immune system response, even if you prime, still takes a little while for you know the full B and T cell response to, to really ramp up. So you might you may still be within that window where you know the phage work in 15 to 30 minute bursts of killing the host, that might be sufficient, but you might then start getting adverse uh, immune response reactions, right? Yeah, uh, this hasn't been published yet, but we um, we have seen what appears to be uh, an, an, an innate uh, an innate uh, immune uh, a, a response to some of our phages uh, within the first week to 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 ten days, and then and then uh, a stronger uh, 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 neutralizing uh, res response to 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 the phages at about. Uh, three weeks in. So there you go, people. Clubhouse just gave you two super news. One, a paper that's going to be submitted, and then some information that will help us actually later, like, with more studies. Thank you so much, Pete. I just want to say that we need to journal club John Paul's paper next time, or whenever it's published. I agree. I agree. We can journal club the, the next, the next page Friday with a PH. Might be journal clubbing uh, papers. This sounds like a great idea. Yeah, and, and you know, one other interesting development. This is still in process, but I guess if you know folks are talking about papers that hasn't haven't been submitted yet, this is still a work in progress as well. Um, and one of the things that we've realized at IPATH, even with working with as, as amazing partners as we have, that, that, you know, we've had something like, you know, 800 phage therapy requests. And of those, like, less than 20, we've actually sourced phage and treated the patient with because there's, well, there's first, there's people that are ineligible. And then sometimes there's trouble in phage and getting the phage purified and grown up and sent to the patient fast enough to you know deliver it in, in all of these are you know life-threatening cases because that's the only thing that fda really um you know allows us to treat right now so what um, over the years we've been approached by any number of entrepreneurs venture capitalists that are trying to you know say hey maybe we could commercialize this phage therapy thing and we've pushed most of them away because we you know it's all about the IP, like the intellectual property and how they can make a buck. And we're at IPAP, we're a nonprofit. We're all about trying to get phage therapy to the people that need it. And most um, people, you know, in developing countries don't have resources um, to pay for phage, or at least very much. So, but recently, um, a couple came to us, um, uh, an entrepreneur and an investment banker. There were more social entrepreneurs who have a, pu a public-private partnership model in mind that would potentially allow us to develop a phage library that's kind of more on looks like Spotify, where that everybody owns their own intellectual property, their own phage, and yet the the library part could be the digital aspect of it. So the sequences, the curation of the phages, the annotation, the a fee model. Um, that would um, go back to benefit the person who donated the phage, um, as well as, you know, where the phage is are housed and things like that. So anyway, it's still very much um, up in the air. We've talked to Baylor, we've talked to TAMU, and we've talked to Phage Directory. 
about it. It's, um, we're going to be talking to um, the FDA to see what they think. And as this idea um, evolves, if it evolves towards something that looks like it might happen, then we'll we'll use them. Well, we'll come to you as Phage Fridays to kind of bounce the idea off off of you all. And because you know our goal is really to ensure that Phage therapy goes to scale. And the model that we have right now isn't sustainable. Um, so. I just wanted to tell you that that's in process and we've had some really helpful comments and feedback so far. Thank you for the, those, that news. That's an amazing, actually, development. Thank you so much and for sharing it with us here and on our Beach Fridays. So um, is there any, please just raise your hand, come up and ask questions, make comments, please don't be shy. I see you, Hedia. I see you, Nathan. Um, Mark, uh, I see you. Uh, Adriana, uh, Bob, Bob will try to send you his question uh, through a messenger. Okay, sounds good. I am in front of the computer opening my messenger right now to see if I can get his question in. I have a silly question. So, no question is silly. No enough. question is silly, yeah. So I hear there's a movie that may be coming out that could be about this book, maybe. Um, so who's going to play you? If <laughs> Stephanie. From Hollywood, of course, the COVID pandemic shut down Hollywood. So, <clears throat> so it's still uh, available to be optioned. So we don't have a movie deal in the works yet, um, but we still have a number of, um, you know, interesting uh, players in Hollywood sniffing around. Um, you know, often when you option your book, you don't get a say in who gets to play you. But I mean, I what I will tell them though is that I don't want any anti-vaxxers or anti-science people, um, you know, to play me because I think that that would um, undermine the credibility. Um, there are a number of documentaries though um, that are featuring our story. One is actually available free online as of today. It's called Beating Superbugs: Can We Win? by recombinant films. And so if you uh, if you Google beating superbugs, um, I'm just about to tweet about it today. Um, feel free to check that out. There's also uh, PBS and um, what's the other one? Discovery Channel or each one as the Australian Broadcasting Corporation has. Uh, uh, we were just um, filmed for a documentary in China. Um, I think it's called, the, it's like China's Netflix equivalent called um, is it Yuku, something like that. Um, so as these become available, we'll share them because the goal is really to ensure that people hear about phage therapy and realize that, you know, there's more to antibiotics than antibiotics. That's awesome. So I have the question here by Bob, which is actually a comment to the first question that was asked. Oh, did he leave? Yeah, he left. Well, sorry. Um, it's a comment to the question that was asked first about the bacterial, the phage uh, infecting um, bacterial in stationary phase. So Bob said, I just wanted to chime in on the first question on phage treatment of stationary phase cells. That is, that is a particularly good question. We are used to studying the relationship of phages with exponentially growing cells, but it is a relatively exotic lifestyle in almost any environment. Bacterial cells in the human body uh, and elsewhere spend very little time in exponential phase for context of a single E. coli uh, cell were to stay in exponential phase, its progeny would be the mass of the earth within 24 hours. So knowing that most of the problematic cells that we want to address will indeed be in stationary phase when the phage encounters them. Can we expect the phage to work still? It seems that phages have a variety of strategies for dealing with the cells that lack resources to generate the kinds of productive infections that we are used to studying. For example, phage T4 will decide in early infection whether it wants to scavenge the cell for a few phage progeny that will be able to mate anyway, or alternatively, hibernate in the cell within 
uh, until the cell encounters better times. Where are you? Where am I? <laughs> uh, if even extraordinary lethal uh, phages like T4 are able to keep their host in hibernation, it is likely that these strategies are widespread. In any event, whether the phage are able to generate a progeny or not, when a lytic phage encounters a susceptible cell, it will kill it. It will. It will still kill that cell. There you go. I hope I did justice to, justice to, to your words, Bob, because they it was an awesome response, and thank you so much for your comments. Amazing. I hope I did justice to your words. I love all the phage experts on here. Amazing. You are welcome, Bob. So if any, also in any other app that does not allow them to unmute their um, their microphones, please feel free to text me uh, or email me or message me through Facebook or whichever platform you prefer so that I can ask your question if that's the case. Well, I know we only got a few more minutes left before the top of the hour. And Correct. Wherever the top of the, of the hour is in the world, because we have people joining from as far away as, as Russia. Um, and I did want to tell you that for people that um, at least live in North America, um, I could send a signed copy of the book, uh, especially in the U.S., for a flat rate. So there's the paperback and the hard copy. So feel free to send me a message. Um, and um, my email address, um, the, the, the easiest one might be Stephanie Strathdee, all one word, at gmail.com. Um, or you can um, send a message on Facebook um, and um, we'll be happy to, to help you out if that's what you, what you would like. So there you go, people. We can get signed copies of the book if you're on this side of the planet. Sorry. But Maybe we could try to figure out a way to get it to the other side. Well, it, Maybe. It, actually it will has, be more expensive, though. Yeah, but it, it has been translated into Russian, Japanese, and Chinese, too, I should mention. So it's available in, in Russia, in Russian, and with a totally different cover. There you go. Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know Betty wanted to chime in, but she doesn't have an iPhone, and it's been complicated. I was trying to 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 uh, get her on Skype like we did last time. Last time, it was not not possible for her to get in. But she sends her hellos, um, and she says hello to everybody. She says that she enjoyed our last talk and she hopes to do it again. That's great. Thank you again, Stephanie. Thank you for inviting. And let everybody sing a happy birthday to Adriana, okay, if you can. Unmute, uh, everybody unmute. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, 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 you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. I love Fage Fridays, and I'm super lucky that we got our Fage Friday fun today here in Clubhouse. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you all for coming and joining us. Please join us again next week. I don't know what surprise we're going to have. It's always weird, and it's always <laughs> new. So there you go. We also have um, the Fage Club is open for anyone who wants to host a Fage. Jan has the Fage Club ownership or whatever, but we're getting used to how it works. But other people can host events under it, so let us know. And we have our page night on Wednesday nights on Clubhouse at 9 Eastern. Um, but we don't know what we're doing next week. But it'll, Oh, no, we do. Justin. Yeah. Justin Clark. Yay. Hello. So that's Excellent. A bioinformatics, um, how he uses that to figure out whether phage should be used for therapy or not. So, um, yeah, super excited about that next there you go. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you all. And this room is going to close pretty soon. I will see you next week. I hope you guys are there. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank, Thank you. you. See you all.